So my name's Sebastian. I'm a customer engineer or solution specialist, depending on what day of the week the reorg is. And as a result, um, I do actually work in sales. Now I know that's going to be a little bit weird. People want to hear about like hardcore site reliability engineering and things like that. So what I thought I would do though, because I end up working with a heck of a lot of customers, is kind of break down the principles that we have and marry them with the products that you may or may not be familiar with. Because a lot of times when I go to customers, they're like, oh man, I love what your SRE team is doing. It's super awesome, it's super great. I bought both of the books, which by the way are available for free if you just Google them. Uh, but at the same time, like, what, what do I actually do to start implementing some of these best practices? So with that, I'm going to do that, and then afterwards I'm going to try to keep some time for more Q&A, because I want it to be a little bit more about empowering you guys, as opposed to just me talking about random things as we kind of go along. So, just as a quick little recap here, here are our principles. Right? Now, don't try to read necessarily the things that are on the screen. The guy who reviewed my slides was like, hey, by the way, this is like super small. It's like, yep, it is super small, but in general, we've like published these things like several years ago. But in broadly, we've got eliminating toil, automation, release engineering, simplicity, embracing risk, SLOs, and monitoring. Uh, my apologies to boiling down the entire automation thing to just automate all the things, but for the most part, that's kind of the mentality that I like uh, when it comes to that particular category. The way that I like thinking about these things, however, is to kind of put them in buckets. Because some of them overlap and a lot of them are kind of like integrated with some other components. So let's go ahead and put these in some buckets. So first of all, I have one bucket over here for simplicity. Anything that you're building, generally speaking, should be as simple as possible. And that's not just like keep it simple stupid. But if you find yourself using a particular tool and you're like, wow, you know, I have to do a lot of work in order to get this tool to work properly, or there's a lot of glue code I have to write around it, or a lot of extra scripts, chances are you, you might be doing something that runs opposite or against the grain of what that tool was designed to do or what you're trying to accomplish. So in general, though, the other buckets that we've got here, we've got eliminating toil and automation. I put that in the stop doing things manually bucket. Over in release engineering, I think that's a kind of a big important thing in and of itself, so that gets its own bucket. And then la uh, lastly, bucket three here is all about embracing risk, having the SLOs, and monitoring. So it's all about establishing the appropriate SLIs, figuring out what your SLOs are going to be, and making sure that you're monitoring them so you can do those appropriate calculations. So now that we've got these types of buckets, let's approach each one of these buckets and then I'll show you some of the GCP products and services that we have that make it very easy for you to build, say, a planet scale computer that is properly monitored, properly metric, and is somewhat reliable. But first, there is actually a catch. Now, what would this catch actually be? Well, it turns out that when you want to do things like hermetic builds and if you want to do things like have appropriate monitoring and whatnot, you need to have an underlying platform that is responsive and capable of running these types of things. You want something that has built-in automation, built-in orchestration, monitoring, and so on and so forth. So what I'm gonna say is, the catch here is that you're going to use something like the components inside of Anthos, or formerly the cloud services platform, but we added a few things on top of it. Now I'm not saying you have to use that particular product, just that that product is actually a meta project, a product that actually encompasses a heck of a lot of other components. For example, here, which are, eh, I guess they're kind of showing up there, you've got a couple extra components you might see here on the periphery. Things like Knative, you've got Istio and, and Kubernetes down there. You've got Cloud Build, and you've got the rest of the sort of the GCP portfolio down here. So let's dive in with these things, but just to kind of give you a quick, like, recap of why I think this is a really awesome platform so that we're on the same page. We've got a handful of these different types of components explained here, right? So we've got application-centric runtime configuration orchestration, which is all of the words in your buzzword bingo, so go ahead and check that one off. Uh, but in general, it's, it's basically like you need to have a declarative system that says, I want these things to be running in this fashion. Right? The core of SRE, to me, is all about the programmatic operation of your infrastructure. Your infrastructure powers your applications, your applications are tied to your business goals, which means that you're programming your business. That's what this is all about, trying to remove people from the equation while still making sure that things run properly and you're reactive and you're continuing with your development. 
The other thing that I like about Anthos and, and, and CSP and all of the, the components that are inside it are it's built from open source compute, uh, components, which means it's hybrid and multi-cloud. So anything I'm preaching up here today, you can take with you regardless of where you want to deploy it. I think you'll find that, uh, of course, again, being in sales, that it runs really well on our platform because it's nice and integrated and things like that. But it's designed to allow you to get to that right once, run anywhere mentality that we were talking about. People like Urs were talking about, and people like Thomas Corian were talking about. The other thing is it gives you things like hermetic builds and containers because it's all container orchestration and container automation. So you check that right off your box. The other cool thing that you've got is built-in support for things like canary deployments and rollbacks. If something goes wrong, you want that mean time to recovery to be very, very short, very, very quick, so you can get things working again. I don't necessarily, well, I, I do know how to do it without using sort of Kubernetes in that entire stack, but it's painful and I don't like doing that sort of thing. Containers, on the other hand, it's literally one command and then you're all set. And then last thing, I, I like the fact that you can get service level telemetry, which is a really cool component that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Keep in mind, all of this is designed to keep developers and operators happy. Like the reason why we're putting these things together is not just because it's a yet another new technology that we think is an interesting technology or we want you to do it in a particular way. Kudos to uh, the Anthos team for getting a round of applause. But the reason why we're putting these things together is to make your lives easier, to be able to run those services reliably and without spending a heck of a lot of time trying to configure something. The, uh, the tagline that I always use when I give presentations is, infrastructure for the sake of infrastructure is pointless. In the sense of like, if I have to build up a bunch of infrastructure to run other infrastructure, then I have infrastructure over here that still needs to be managed and configured and monitored and so forth. The further you are away from actually running just an application, which is tied to your business goal, the less e efficient your overall system is. So with that in mind, let's dive into the first, uh, first bucket that we have. This first bucket is automation and toil. I want to start with that one. Why? Well, predominantly because automation and toil are easy things to sort of tackle, especially on our platform. So if we go back to the diagram here, this is sort of the, the, the overall diagram of Anthos and uh, some of the products that are inside of it. So where would, say, automation and toil? If we really want to focus on that, what products would I recommend? How would I recommend using that sort of thing? Well, it turns out it's actually all of them because everything in a cloud computing environment is API driven. So anything that you want to do is naturally going to be scriptable, it's going to be callable, and it's going to be integrated in the rest of the platform. One of the nice benefits of like the promise of cloud computing in general is that everything that you have can just be invoked with some sort of API call and then you're done. You don't have the equivalent of an API call for a person to have something like remote hands you don't have like order procurement, purchasing, racking and stacking, things like that. You can just hit it and kind of go from there. However, the, the, the value that you end up getting from having an entire system be automatable, an entire, every, uh, entire system being able to be uh, easily scripted, is that you have this API-centric design, right? The, the concept of an API-centric design as opposed to a design that has like clients and other random things, is that we build the API first and then we figure out which clients we want to build as a result of that later on. So your G Cloud command that you run or your console command that you run, if you ever run that little command on the bottom, it says like view the equivalent JSON post or view the equivalent G Cloud command to your clicks. It's all the same stuff. I get a handful of customers that always ask me like, well, well how do I make sure that a person has access to this but not access to that? And we always have to remind them like, well, it's actually the API call that you really wanna be focusing on here. It's not necessarily restricting access to just the command line or just something else. So that's kind of important. But I wanna focus a little bit more on toil. To recap, toil, this is the, uh, the SRE definition of toil that I pulled right from the book. Um, I'll kind of paraphrase it here, but in general, you're running a production service. You're doing work to be able to enable that particular production service. It doesn't have a lot of enduring value. And usually the state of the system is is sort of left the same. My apologies to this group of the, uh, the audience who's having difficulty reading that sort of thing. I apologize. Anyway, in, to try to eliminate toil, you have to ask yourself, like, why am I doing this particular task? If I have to like, bootstrap a bunch of stuff, even in a cloud environment, like, can we go set up the you know, organization? Can we set up all of these particular nodes, the firewall rules, the monitoring, and these sorts of things? 
if you're doing that manually, repeatedly, every time you want to deploy something, every time you want to get something up and running or recover from failure or something like that, you end up, you're, you're, you're spending a lot of time doing work that isn't necessarily driving value for your company or your organization. So, I wanna focus on a couple of the interesting products that we've got in this area. If we look back to the components, we can orchestrate pretty much all of this fun stuff. And how do we do that? Well, big popular things that we've got are things like Cloud Deployment Manager, which is basically just a, you know, a JSON-y, YAML-y, Python-y type thing that you define your infrastructure, hit the button, and then boom, we take it and run it for you. You can do the same thing with, say, HashiCorp's Terraform. I think they have a booth somewhere around here. We like them a lot, and we also like them enough that we include Terraform in the Cloud Shell, for example. What I'm getting at here is the left two um, big blocks here are infrastructure as code. Again, we get back to that notion of a declarative infrastructure, where you define how your infrastructure is going to be built once, and then you let something else figure out how to move the state to that desired state. But I also want to mention, we've got like cloud functions over here. We've got serverless architecture that allows you to have an event-driven workflow, meaning like if I want to talk to cloud functions or if I want to do something else and key off of some other event that's happening, cloud functions is a really good solution to be able to do that. Speaking of which, here's an interesting piece of architecture that's, uh, that I took right from our uh, cloud.google.com blog. This is uh, one of the, I think, documented things on how to do auto inserts if you upload a file into GCS. So if you take a look here, again, apologies to these guys, you upload a file into uh, a cloud storage backend, you then figure out how to move that into, say, BigQuery to be able to do an analytics and, and other fun stuff off of that. What's nifty about it is it's a pipeline. So you've just defined a pipeline that you don't have to stand up requisite infrastructure to be able to listen for these types of events. It's included just within cloud functions. So if you're doing something, and it's, let's say, a task that you need to do to continue serving whatever the output of this particular pipeline would look like, you can leverage cloud functions to key off of those types of event triggers and then take steps on your behalf. The other thing which is kind of cool about this is Cloud functions are just little tiny like JavaScript-y, wrapper-y things, which means that you don't ne necessarily have to be a full SDK developer to figure out what's going on. Usually it's just, I listen for an event, I figure out some JSON, and I post it to another backend, and then it, it kind of works well together. Again, going back to that API-centric design that I was talking about before. However, we've got some other interesting tools that I want to talk about. One of the ones that I don't think gets a lot of credit these days is Cloud Composer. Cloud Composer is a really powerful tool that a lot of kind of really big enterprise companies that I work with like taking a look at. Well, you might say, well, why is that? Like, what the heck is this darn thing anyway? Well, first of all, it's a really cool Tetris piece. I mean, that's pretty nifty there. But the other thing is, it's Apache Airflow. So you might ask yourself, okay, what's Apache Airflow? Well, it's a bunch of DAGs. Okay, what's a DAG? A directed acyclic graph. In other words, it's a if this, then that kind of thing. Not the company necessarily, but the, the principle of implementation. DAGs work in basically just like a, a standard like flowchart type thing. So you can program certain specific tasks to be done. Imagine if you wanted to have a portal of some sort created where you can provision infrastructure based on the requests of your users. And by users, I mean not, not like necessarily your end users, but you know, corporate users, something like that. Like, hey, I need a VM to go do something, or hey, I need this other thing to be stood up. Maybe it's a complex series of steps which actually requires invocation. You might have written a bunch of Terraform before, but now you're constantly modifying it as these new requests come up. So what do you do? Something like Cloud Composer can do that for you. Also what it can do, which is kind of interesting, is you can schedule an invocation or schedule an execution of whatever you've programmed, meaning that repeated tasks that you might be doing, hence like you know something that's a really great candidate for toil, can now be automated away and scheduled away for you to run uh, repeatedly. I'll give you a great example of this. This is automatic backups. Like, wouldn't it be great if you leveraged like the snapshotting functionality that we have inside of our standard GC EVMs at a regular interval, you package it up and then ship it and take it and have it go do something as a result. You can do this. You don't have any manual processes to do this and you don't really have like 
a lot of coding to be done because it, it, it has a very easy to understand sort of programming language that invokes all of these things. Likewise, you don't have to allocate resources for that to be run on. If you were to say, hey, I got a bunch of Python to automate this, I would go, cool, where are you gonna run it? I gotta give you a server to be able to run your Python, and then I gotta be able to give it credentials to be able to make those API calls. Well, with Cloud Composer, you can just write it there, click the button, and then it goes and schedules things, which is really handy. The other cool thing is it integrates with the rest of the cloud based on its SDK. So if you want to automate anything, not just like GCE VMs, but li literally anything that we might have in the cloud, that's a good way to do that. So if you wanted to ask me like, hey, how do I get started with more automation, reducing some toil in my enterprise right now, I would say infrastructure as code solutions, cloud functions, and Cloud Composer. Take a look at all of them, figure out where it can be used in your infrastructure, and then take it from there. Next up, we've got release engineering. I love release engineering because being that DevOps guy, I do a lot of DevOpsy type things. And one of those things is, of course, is setting up CI CD pipelines. I always like to say CI CD CA because I think it's important to be able to continuously audit whatever you have already built inside your infrastructure to make sure that you're in compliance with whatever you wanted to build. So if we go back to the uh, little chart here, what piece am I actually talking about? It's that one right there. Cloud build. I really like cloud build. Like, I really like it. Why do I like it? Well, first of all, I basically just point it at a source repo, and then I say, trigger off of these tags, and it goes and it builds my containers for me. Again, the, the requisite infrastructure we're talking about is container native. What's great about that is because of the prevalence of microservices and emphasis on micro, like we're, we're not building like six gig containers here, we're building small containers very frequently, Integrating things like unit tests into it so that you have, say, some Go code, some Java code, some Python, whatever it happens to be, it will build that, compile it, run the unit tests, build the Docker container, push the Docker container up, tag the Docker container, and be ready to go. That's super powerful. Not only is that super powerful, but because everything, like I said, is API-driven and event-specific, you can then key off of that. So, for example, one of the great pieces of um, Solution Architect developed uh, pipelines that we've got takes Cloud Build, takes Spinnaker, which is a great open source uh, continuous deployment uh, mechanism, and then puts them together. So Spinnaker watches for new uh, images inside the Docker registry. That builds those images and pushes them up, which is pretty nice. But I want to focus on sort of the like the kind of the, the the principles that we're trying to solve here, right? So if we think about release engineering, here's a here's a couple different choice words from the uh, SRE handbook. Self-service, high-velocity, hermetic builds, and enforcement of releases in a pragmatic, continuous way. Back before Docker became super popular, if, you were to, if I were to put this slide up to a, a, an audience full of industry professionals, you'd be like, hermetic builds? Like, what, what are you guys talking about? Now that we have the concept of containers widely available and everyone sort of agreed on them, this is a heck of a lot easier to, um, uh, to, to get stood up. I want to focus on two of the words that are there. Well, it might be interesting or might be tempting to focus on continuous because you've got continuous integration and continuous delivery. I actually want to focus on hermetic and I want to focus on enforcement. These are kind of interesting developments here. Number one, if you're building a bunch of stuff but your build environment is constantly changing, you're never building the same thing. If you kick off a build and you kick off a build of the exact same source repo and the exact same thing, we should get the exact same SHA sum at the end of that build. There shouldn't be any weird introduction back and forth. That is easier to accomplish with things like microservices and easier to accomplish with things like containers. Or another word, here's some nice blue hexagons to help you out with this. You've got container builder and you've got the container registry. Again, you don't have to worry about standing up infrastructure to be able to host all of these containers in a secure way, in a private way, with the appropriate amount of identity and access management on top of it. And you don't have to worry about how, how to build all of these things. Like, how do I run that you know, go build or how do I run that Java C command? This will do that for you. The other cool part about here, we can actually have some enforcement stuff taken care of, like I mentioned through Cloud IAM, and here's Spinnaker over here. So a lot of questions I also get in terms of setting up CI CD pipelines from customers are, well, that's great. I get the concept of building this, you know, this application or this container or something like that, but how do I gate that for production? How do I make sure that that's deployed in a way that makes sense where I have the appropriate change control? How do I do that? 
Well, actually, Spinnaker allows you to do that right out of the box. As a matter of fact, Spinnaker is natively aware of things like Kubernetes as a deployment target, understands natively out of the box things like GCP, so it understands how to work with IAMs, work with credentials, and so forth to make those things happen. And not only that, it also understands how to do the appropriate change mechanism so that you're in compliance with whatever regulated industry you happen to be in. Here's a really cool um, architecture that uh, our wonderful solution architects have put together. So you got cloud build, Spinnaker equals happy. I like that. It's CI CD made easy. Your developers essentially git commit, git push. That's it. They don't have to do anything else. It pushes up to a cloud source repository. Uh, cloud build picks it up, figures out how to build it and test it at the unit test level, builds the appropriate Docker container, pushes the Docker container up, Spinnaker figures out that, oh, you've got a new thing, automatically, because it's configured to do this in this architecture, automatically deploys a canary deployment, sends a certain amount of traffic to that canary, and then waits for you to click the button to update the percentage of what you're sending to the new version. So let's say you're doing a 10%, 90% split, waits for you to push the button, 100% of the traffic rolls uh, over to the new version. In other words, it kind of looks like this. This is the flow chart of, of what that looks like. So you, you change some code, check it in, it detects a new tag, builds the appropriate image, and then eventually hands it over to Spinnaker that does that release. All of this stuff, by the way, for people that are, are taking pictures, is available on cloud.google.com. These are literally just screenshots that I took. Or actually, I copied the picture, which was kind of fun. Uh, so if you want to head there, if you actually just Google things like continuous integration, Spinnaker, look for the first cloud.google.com entry, and this actually walks you through everything you need to deploy, along with code samples, Helm charts and things that you would need to actually get this stood up and working properly. The important thing, the all important click that uh, managers and CEOs and, and other types of executives want to see is the, we didn't just push this to production and broke everything. This little man icon here, that's the I'm waiting for a human to be involved before I make a decision. So this is literally a screenshot of Spinnaker Push to production, yes or no, continue, stop. You hit the continue button, that's deployed, and then you're all set. Do you have to write all of the additional glue code in order to get this up and running and working? No, that's literally what Spinnaker is. Works natively on the platform, works really well with things like cloud build. So again, you can go from zero to continuous integration and delivery pipeline that's enforced based on the change management process that you want without having to do a lot of extra work. Hence why I called the talk Batteries Included DevOps and Batteries Included SRE. By the way, we have a great YouTube video which talks about the difference between DevOps and SRE. I love the way they summed it up. They've got really cool shirts, which is Class SRE Implements DevOps. I really love that. As an object-oriented guy, I kind of like that. Anywho, last one I want to talk about, which is kind of the most important one, is monitoring and SLOs. This is the big one. Everything up until now, you've, you're probably going, depending on your familiarity with cloud native architectures, you're like, yeah, I get that. Like, I get how to build a container. I'm sold on the whole Kubernetes thing. What have you done for me lately? Well, if you haven't taken a look at some of these really awesome monitoring systems, this is going to be super fun for you. If we go back to the architecture diagram, what am I talking about? I'm talking about this bad boy down here, stack driver service monitoring. Now, wouldn't it be great if as I'm deploying all of these services into production or even into a staging environment or development environment, logging and monitoring happened out of the box without having additional configuration, without having to stand up my own ELK stack or my EFK stack or anything else? What if it just knew how all of this stuff worked? That's what I'm going to talk about right here. But I'm going to talk about some of the advanced stuff as well. Stack driver service monitoring is a really fascinating brand new thing that we kind of rolled out. So what is it? Well, it's SRE monitoring made very easy. Now, why do I say it's SRE monitoring and not just sort of regular monitoring? Because it's per service that you've defined inside of Kubernetes. Because you have a series of microservices that you've deployed and you said these services are going to talk to each other and so forth, you can get all of this additional information. Now, it might be a little bit hard to see here, but the key thing to uh, take away is we have automatic SLO and error budget calculations. So if you're thinking to yourself, you know, okay, I buy the whole error budget thing, I buy the whole SLO, SLI, SLA kind of thing, but how do I actually go implement that? It's like, don't tell me that I have to do something, just do it for me. Stackdriver literally has done that for you. Handful of clicks inside of the UI, 
and it's actually telling you this graph right here is actually your error budget graph. This graph down here is your service level objective compliance. Meaning if this, this graph is going like really low and it goes down below that, you've blown your SLO, your error budget's gonna be crazy high, and then you can correlate it with specific events. So like who broke production, figure out who that was, figure out what the thing was that they were able to get away with, because we wanna have a blameless post-mortem type culture, and then figure out how to automate that from ever happening again. This is, this is a wonderful tool to be able to help you out with that. The other thing I wanna talk about, which some people use stack driver service monitoring. By the way, a lot of the network stuff that it grabs is all coming from Istio, which is really cool. You can get an actual service topology graph. But the next one I wanna talk about is Trace. Now, as we move to distributed systems and we have more and more microservices working, the hard problem becomes why is the site slow or why is something else slow? It's not just a case of one specific service that we can go, oh, well, there it is. A specific call to a front end might invoke dozens of microservices on the back end. If all but one of them is having a problem, or excuse me, if all but one of them is working properly, you won't necessarily know which one of the microservices is going to be at fault. You really want to know, ah, it was that microservice that's having a problem because let's say it's overloaded or something like that. You need a distributed tracing framework. We released a white paper a few years ago called Dapper, which was our solution to solving sort of distributed tracing. As a result of that, we ended up um, uh, releasing the white paper and the open source community kind of picked it up. If you've heard of Zipkin, that's sort of the open source implementation of our Dapper methodology. But there's a couple other things that we can implement or work with. Things like Jaeger, if anyone's heard of, of, of Jaeger, or like open tracing, things like that. But if you want this to just work out of the box, again, that batteries included sort of SRE and DevOps practice, this is already built in. You've got agent support for popular languages. So I think there's like over a half dozen, some odd, basically, unless you're like writing COBOL or something like that, we've got a language that's going to work. It's gonna be able to pick up and integrate with your code base. And also it works with things like Zipkin Collector. So if you've already instrumented based off of Zipkin, we can pick that up and give you a wonderful dashboard that shows you exactly what's going on in your infrastructure. What's great about that is all of the different graphs that you would want for all of the different calls that you have, regardless of the number of microservices that it's going to hit, is, is, is served up in an easy to digest way, which makes debugging very easy. Speaking of debugging, this is the last thing I wanna talk about in this area which is Stackdriver debugging. Now, just out of curiosity, how many people here, by show of hands, are using Stackdriver Trace? Oh, there's a handful of people. There's like three people. How many people are using Stackdriver debug? Do you work at Google? <laughs> so, okay. So there's only like a handful of people here. Now that's really interesting, it's really surprising because this technology has existed for quite a while. And this is how Google does this type of debugging in real time when things go wrong. Number one thing when an error happens is you have to recover as quickly as possible. Do the RCA afterwards, but get that recovery back online so that your users are happy. You don't want to be the company that is you know, losing a million dollars an hour because something isn't running properly. Stackdriver debugging allows you to do production debugging very simply. Again, agent support for popular languages and SDK so you can integrate with all of this stuff, but essentially you can insert breakpoints and things like that and receive instrumentation from something that you have deployed in production. It works great with, say, Kubernetes Engine, and it also works great, I believe, with, with App Engine as well, which is really cool. And here's the really cool part, at least for me, it integrates with your source control management, meaning it can even go this line of code is emitting this particular breakpoint, here's the debug information that you wanted. That's really powerful because you always are going to run into a, a situation where something in production is going to die for some random reason. And you want to collect better information if that occurs and figure out how to correct it. Development environments oftentimes don't 100% uh, match that of production. Obviously, DevOps best practice says that they should as much as possible, but it's difficult to be able to get the little fine-tuned details that you might have, particularly if users are using the site a little bit differently than something else. So stack driver debugging, super awesome to be able to do that. So if you take a look at all of these things, 
you can go, wow, I can have automation, I can start to eliminate toil, I can keep things simple because we have specific tools built for specific things, and the SRE book tells us that tools and culture are kind of inextricably linked, and we've got all of these additional tools out of the box to help with things like advanced SLO calculation, you can go from zero to like production grade sort of SRE best practices with very little modification to what you're doing. You just pop it, take a look at some of the stuff that we've got in our platform, and take it from there. So, last thing I wanna talk about, which might be unique to our platform, as opposed to, say, other platforms and whatnot, is that we've got help for if and when you need it. This is not a journey that I advise people take by themselves. We refer to customers as partners because it's a joint partnership that we embark on. If you're successful on our platform, we're successful. If we just go, hey, here's all of our products, good luck, and then everything fails for you, you're not gonna be happy, and we're not going to be happy as a result. All of this stuff has to happen in a nature of collaboration, back and forth. If you've got an interesting feature, work with your account team to try to get that feature pushed up into production. Meet with engineering leadership to get their insight into what we see the future as. But we want insight from all of you as well, because we wanna know what's interesting in your industry so we can incorporate that feedback. A couple things specifically with respect to uh, SRE and sort of DevOpsy type things. We've got customer reliability engineers, and we also have professional services. Uh, is my friend Eric here in the audience? Not that Eric, but thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, my other friend was uh, actually a, a PSO, is, is a member of a professional services organization, and they're working on a, uh, like a specific offering to help you out that's SOW driven or statement of work driven to help evaluate some of the stuff that you're working on and help you actually transition applications up to production. But it's a little bit more hands on, a little bit more detailed. The really cool thing is our customer reliability engineers. These are like Google SREs that help work in your company to take applications that you have, do that SRE assessment, and then pull that into sort of a modern way of thinking about things. It's kind of interesting. Part of the reason it's interesting is because it's free, but part of the reason why it's also interesting is because it requires a substantial investment of your time to be able to modernize that type of application and actually get things working really well. I, I highly recommend either one of these types of services, depending on what your mix is, depending on what your fit is, because we want to see people start adopting this type of better site reliability engineering practices to leverage our platforms understanding regionality and zonality and figuring out how to make sure you get that fifth nine that you're looking for by deploying really large scale infrastructures that have proper disaster recovery that adhere to all of the principles that I was talking about today. So they're there. Now, I kind of went through this very quickly, but I wanted to save some time for some questions and whatnot. We've got uh, some CRE people that are here in case you've got questions about CRE engagements or some best practices and some other things. And I think I've got like, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that? A good 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Awesome. So with that, just to recap, so everyone's on the same page, this is what uh, the Anthos platform kind of looks like. These are all of the components inside of it. The big thing is that you've got things like Kubernetes and Istio. You've got things like Knative. You've got something that automatically builds the containers for you. You've got something that monitors it, and it runs on our platform in a very easy and integrated way. In other words, if you wanted to like put up some blue hexagons and then match them with the specific things, I would say you've got debugger for embracing risk. You've got uh, stack driver service monitoring for your SLOs. You've got composer to help you out with something like eliminating toil or additional automation. Deployment manager or any other infrastructure as code type offering. Stack driver trace, super important to try to figure out as you move towards these microservices. You've got cloud build and spinnaker for your release engineering. And then lastly, you've got simplicity. So with this in integrated kind of bundled products that we have that, that we call Anthos that can run kind of anywhere that has all of these things sort of integrated, it's very simple to go from zero to whatever it is that you want to be able to deploy in production very quickly. And with that, thanks a bunch. I'll be here to answer a bunch of questions and, and chat with you after the fact.